army, roust them up, turn around, do a 180 and head north, Washington would be caught between a rock and a hard place. So again, I agree with you. Washington was definitely, he was a gambler and he often had very good luck. Not always, but often. He seemed to have it when he needed it. All right. So they cross the river and what's happening in Princeton? All right, so we're going to go march up to Princeton with Washington and the Continental Army. At Princeton, the British had about 2,500 soldiers, so a much smaller group there. And they were under the command of a man named Charles Mahood. Um, Mahood, I looked that up, and I think that's how you pronounce it. On January 3rd, uh, Washington arrives at Princeton. He was threatening to get in the rear of the British forces there. So he's going to do that classic flanking thing, get around behind them. Mahood doesn't want any part of that, so he turned his force around, and, and the British is de- army there at Princeton is deployed around a nearby orchard and a farmhouse. And one of Washington's favorite subordinates, General Hugh Mercer, spotted the British, and he ordered his soldiers into a battle line. Mercer's force exchanged fire with the British, and he fell back. The British conducted a bayonet charge in which Mercer was seriously wounded. I read that the, the British stabbed him about seven times or so, or maybe more. I can't remember the exact number, but yeah, they, when they were angry, they didn't (laughs) behave as civilized gentlemen. Let's put it that way, especially not to officers. Uh, Cadwallader's troops marched forward, but they got mixed up with Mercer's retreating soldiers. So the American position looks like it's about to collapse. It looks like this gamble of Washington's has not paid off, but Then, just in time, Washington arrives on the battlefield, and he rallied the troops, and he was really good at doing that, too. He was really good at getting people to stop running, turn around, and get back in line and start shooting again. He brought in some reinforcements. He organized the Americans into a coherent battle line. And a brigade under General Arthur St. Clair marched toward a group of Mahood soldiers, and these soldiers were holed up in Nassau Hall. And this was on the campus. It was called the College of New Jersey at the time, but later it will be Princeton University. Nassau Hall, to this day, is one of the oldest buildings on that campus. Uh, And these British soldiers inside of Nassau Hall, which is basically like a combination dining hall, dormitory, who knows what else, they tried to make it into a fortress. Um, That's not going to work too (laughs) well, is it, Scott? Most dormitories are not designed to be (laughs) fortresses. Right. I mean, the the modern ones, if they're kind of cinder block squares, could be a little bit more robust back then. I don't think so. Yeah, it's going to be made out of wood primarily, if not entirely. And But it's all they had. They didn't really have much of a choice. It was the nearest available building. So the Americans say, let's blast away. So they bombard the building with cannon. Then a group of soldiers charged the building. And just when they were about to break down the door, the British soldiers inside waved a white flag and 194 soldiers surrendered. And that is essentially the end of the Battle of Princeton. These are not long, complicated battles. Again, these are not anything like some of the Civil War battles we talked about, which sometimes go on for several days and have tens, if not hundreds of thousands of men. Cornwallis decides, all right, enough is enough. He withdrew the army. They left Trenton, they left Princeton, and they went to New Brunswick, uh, which is also New Jersey. So Washington is basically one, I'm going to call it three victories in a row. Trenton is obviously an American victory, overwhelming. Second Trenton, okay, maybe more of a tie, but, but Washington at least stopped the British advance and he was able to do what he wanted to. He had his way, so that, that, that's at least a semi-victory. And then, of course, Princeton is a victory too. A lot of the British soldiers surrender. The rest of them leave. But Washington is still not done. A few days later, American forces took Hackensack, and they took Elizabethtown, and Washington's army took Morristown. So, a great run for Washington and the Continental Army. The British, two weeks before, they had controlled just about all of New Jersey. Now they're combined, confined to just two areas, Amboy and New Brunswick, so two towns. But more importantly, as we've already touched upon For the Americans, their morale soared. Washington's army now believed they were capable of defeating the British. So uh, for once, they're moving forward, they're attacking, they're winning. Uh, Even when they're defending, they're fighting off the British instead of just retreating all the time. 
the rate of desertion decreased. We're going to see that throughout the war. When the Americans win battles, people don't desert as much as they do when you lose battles because you feel like you're part of a winning team. So there you go. Hey, everyone. Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. This really changes things from where the Americans were standing only a month or two earlier. Washington, he again gambles on British complacency. He is right, and this is what kicks off a lot of these successes. Then he makes his winter camp in Morristown, which is an easy striking distance of the British at New York. And again, Howe still doesn't have a stomach for a winter campaign, even though a British assault could end the revolution. When he stays in Morristown, Washington's laying claim to most of New Jersey. And Benjamin Franklin says at the time that there weren't enough Englishmen willing to die for their country to subdue the growing American nation. Well, at least not at this period in the war. Uh, So I thought I would mention just kind of a wrap up on how different leaders on both sides perform. There is a book by Larry Schweiker on the Revolutionary War. I forget the name, but I'll include in the show notes where he gives a science grade to different figures. I thought I would look at this because it's interesting. So on the British side, Richard Howe gets a C because he underestimated Washington and this created the opportunity at Trenton. Johann Rall gets a D because he was brave, but he had too much faith in his Hessians as being the most battle hardened mercenaries in the world. Yeah. And didn't take the Americans seriously. Right. Big mistake. Charles Cornwallis gets an F. (laughs) <laughs> he could have yeah. defe- he could have defeated Washington, but he waited till the morning. Not moving fast enough. Uh, on the American side, Schweikert gives Washington a B. His plan of attack on Trenton is overly complex, and it was good in theory, but he didn't have the commanders to be able to pull it off. Sort of a Robert E. Lee problem, I guess. And he has his later return to New Jersey was an unnecessary gamble. He staked his command on a night march around the British flank. It worked, but some would say it was reckless. But you can't argue against his personal bravery at Princeton, going into Trenton. What he does to patriot morale is a huge turning point, and he gambles, but his gambles pay off. John Sullivan, he gets a D for his lackluster performance from an incompetent commander. Yeah, I Uh, didn't even mention Sullivan, but I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah. And then there's others. <laughs> he does better than Israel Putnam, who never showed up with the reinforcements Washington was expecting. And James Ewing, he lets the weather stop him from even getting across the Delaware. Lastly, John Cadwallader. What would you give him, James? I would give him B minus, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah, that's. <laughs> I mean, he got turned away the first on the first day when they were attacking Trenton on Christmas, but. Then he uh, did a a good job at the Battle of Princeton. So, you know, decent. Yeah, I'd say so. But not horrible. Yeah, I think a B is fair where when he recrosses the Delaware, this allows Washington to follow up the Battle of Trenton with another victory. Not too bad. Much better than the New York campaign, to be sure. Yeah, that the the New York campaign, the Americans get a D at best. I mean, they tried. They, you know, I, I... I guess they could maybe get a C minus for even surviving, but this has got to be at least a B plus, if not an A minus. Can I say one other thing too? Please. It's time for me to finally mention dun da da dun a movie. Yes. <laughs> now there's not nearly as many movies, at least recent ones. Okay, maybe you might say, well, back in nineteen seven, the nineteen thirty seven, there was blah blah blah. But uh, I'm more of a recent movie guy, and there's really not nearly as many. Uh, recent movies about the revolution than there are about the civil war. There's so many about the civil war. Um, I mean, not, not bazillion, but you know, a a dozen or so ish, but um, there's the Patriot. We're going to put that on the shelf for now and talk about it later because that deals with the war in the South. But there's a really good movie that was made for cable, I believe. So it's not real famous, but it's called the crossing. And it's about the Battle of Trenton. It's, you know, like all Hollywood movies, it sometimes plays fast and loose with the facts. For one thing, in the movie, Washington calls all of his subordinate commanders by their first names. 
No, 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 no. No, I mean that like Washington would never do that. I mean, maybe occasionally one on one, but not in front of everybody. He was very stiff and formal. I mean, it was going to be, you know, General Sullivan, General General Sterling, you know, Colonel Hamilton. It wouldn't be Alex and William and John and all that. I mean, they would um, follow the British pattern of decorum, which not until well into the 20th century and even among many today, a close friend you would refer to by their last name to refer to someone by their Christian name, as they would call it, you would have to be a family member essentially. So yes. yeah, it would indicate a lack of respect too. Um, but nevertheless, overall the movie gets the big picture, right? So I strongly recommend that the, the, the person that plays George Washington is Jeff Daniels, who is a veteran character actor and, He's also in my one of my favorite Civil War movies, Gettysburg. But uh, here, Jeff Daniels is George Washington, and he really does a good job other than the, the limitations placed on him by the script. <laughs> There's a few other minor things, too, but it, it, it essentially gets, as I mentioned, the big picture right. So uh, check that movie out if you can find it. You can, I know you, you probably buy the DVD on, on Amazon or somewhere like that for five bucks, it's, it's, or you can maybe find it in your local library. But it's definitely worth watching if you want to uh, get a feel for what it must have been like to be at the Battle of Trenton. All right. Well, I'm glad we're getting to get back into the swing of movie recommendations. True. Not as many as the Civil War. By far, World War II has the lion's share of movies. Oh, yeah. Plenty of fertile ground. Stories that haven't been told with the Revolutionary War, but we'll be doing our best to incorporate this as much as possible. So, James, where does the war take us in the next episode? Well, we're going to leave. Washington behind. He's going to eventually go into winter camp and we're going to head north and we're going to see how the British are going to deal with New York and the New England colonies. They're going to come up with this grand plan to try to cut the colonies in half to try to use the uh, Hudson River and uh, Fort Ticonderoga and Lake Champlain and that area. They're going to try to take control of that. Hopefully, therefore, you know, cordoning off or isolating the New England colonies, which is where all the trouble started pretty much, and see if they can end the rebellion that way, that way by cutting them in two and isolating New England. And we'll see if that works next time. And listeners, I hope you love Foppish Dandies because we have them by the wagon full with our British officers we're going to meet in the next episode. Oh, so. we're going to have so much fun. Yes. All right. Plenty of wine, women, and song lovers. All right. We'll see you all in the next episode and take you to the Battle of Saratoga. All right. That is today's episode. First off, I want to give a shout out to the Spy Masters for the Knowlton's Rangers. Vic Austin, Chris, Rob Matlock, Alan Baker, Beverly Ingle, Jake Harrington, Todd Warren, William Ivey, Joyce Norman, Tyler from Colorado, Josh Reddick, Daniel Lawson, Marlene, Michael, Tim Clark, David Powell, Moondoggy from Ohio, Melissa, Chris from Maine, Carl from Norway, and Baron Fraza. I'll explain what that is in a second. If you like the show and want to help it grow, there are four easy ways for you to do it. One, like and subscribe to the show on the podcast player of your choice. This helps spread the word about the show. Two, join our Facebook group. Here we can keep the discussion going about new episodes and you can talk about what you like and didn't like. And you can find this group if you just search for History Unplugged on Facebook. Three, we have an online store with t-shirts, phone covers, and other accessories featuring awesomely bad history puns that were crowdsourced by you, the audience. And you can find that if you go to tpublic, T-E-E, public.com and look for History Unplugged, or you just go to historyonthenet.com and look for our store there. Four, and this is really the best way to dive deep with History Unplugged, and that's to become one of the Knowlton's Rangers. If you know your American history, you know the Knowlton's Rangers were an elite spy and reconnaissance group in the American Revolutionary War, but it's also the name of the membership program of History Unplugged. You can join at three levels. If you join at the level of Scout, you can hear all the episodes of History Unplugged completely ad-free and get early access to new episodes, at least a week early. If you join at the Intelligence Officer level, you get special bonus episodes, like a 10-part series on the World War II hero Audie Murphy, a multi-part series called Ottoman Lives about different people in the Ottoman Empire, and a series called Rendezvous with Death that looks at biographical profiles of Americans who went to fight in World War I before America entered the war. The last level is Spy Master, where you get all that stuff, but you also get three hardcover history books, Forging a President, How the Wild West Created Teddy Roosevelt, Race to the Top of the World, Richard Byrd and the First Flight to the North Pole, and The Last Fighter Pilot, the true story of the final combat mission of World War II. Another bonus is you can choose a history topic for me to focus on for an entire episode that can go up to an hour, and I'll answer whatever question you have for me, 
and you get a shout out at the end of each episode. If you want to learn how to become a member of the Knowlton's Rangers, go to patreon.com slash unplugged. That's patreon.com slash unplugged.